So listen to this. 14 days, 3 matches, 3 chances to win 3 titles. No team in Germany, not even Bayern, had ever won a treble, but suddenly in 2002, that's how close Leverkusen had gotten to completing football and making history. Back then, they were playing the most attractive football in Europe. They were the first team in history to make the Champions League final without ever winning their own league. They were so good that Man United fans gave them a standing ovation. Their manager was so mystifying that Sir Alex Ferguson himself wrote him letters for years. Even the great Marcello Lippi had to leave their stadium with his tail between his legs, ashamed that he had dared to underestimate them. However, one way or another, once those two weeks had passed, they had won absolutely nothing. It was the greatest joke in the history of football, the fairy tale that never happened, a gigantic warning sign for Xabi Alonso's Leverkusen, and a season so catastrophic, so unpredictable, that their very own director of football literally had a heart attack, not once, not twice, but three different times. There is a reason it became known as the travel of horror, but what seems to have slipped everyone's minds, the strangest thing in all of that, is that even once they were that close to making history, there were a few who foreshadowed their demise. As one journalist wrote for Build magazine, it must not be that this great team is left empty-handed at the end, that cannot be the will of the football gods. It would be one thing to predict that they could miss out on the treble, but to at that moment insinuate they could go trophyless, that seemed like madness, unless you knew anything about their past. Way before all of this, Leverkusen were already known as some of the biggest losers in the sport. British fans called them Neverkusen, the Germans believed they were cursed. They even toyed with the idea of banning their players from the national team, scared the curse would follow them there. And honestly, I don't blame them. In 97, Leverkusen could have won the title, but somehow they got demolished 4 0 by 10th place FC Köln and ended up losing out on the trophy by only 2 points. In 99, they finished second again again and in 2000, well, I'm guessing it was at that point they started blaming the football gods because with one match to go, they only needed a draw against SPVGG Hacken, a team that had spent most of their existence in the third tier and had only reached the Bundesliga for the first time that year and still, 20 minutes in, Balak himself scored an own goal, ruining their season and allowing Bayern's sports director to humiliate them, claiming on national TV that Bayern will never win anything. When they play decisive games, they put their diapers on. But if you think that was bad, then guess what? Regardless of how much they had suffered over those four years, that was still their golden era. And the man behind it, the only person in the team who actually knew what it felt like to win the Bundesliga, was manager Christoph Daum. But then, out of nowhere, the press accused them of not only being a frequent customer of some very adult parties, but also of having a substance abuse problem regarding a certain Colombian white powder, to which he went ahead and denied the whole whole thing, even providing his own hair samples in order to affirm his innocence, only for the test to come out positive, forcing him to admit to all of it, not just being sacked at Leverkusen, but having his pre-agreement to become the German national team's new manager completely cancelled. So then, Berti Vogts came in, Leverkusen finished fourth and though that wasn't good, at least it wasn't second, so it was enough to convince many that the curse was over, but as you may imagine, those people were wrong. No matter how painful it can be, clubs tend to prefer to finish second rather than fourth, so they sacked Berti, a manager who had won an European championship, who back in his playing days won everything from a World Cup to two UEFA Cups and five Bundesligas, and replaced him with Klaus. Stop Muller. A guy that had never won a title, a guy that had been out of a job for almost a year after being sacked by Saarbrücken in the second tier, and that was mostly famous for speaking out the words bye bye Bayern as his Frankfurt set five points clear at the top of the table, only to eventually choke the title. But as much as he seemed doomed to relieve the curse of Neverkusen, this signing actually made a lot of sense. In fact, the only reason he didn't beat Verti Vox to the job a year earlier was that he supposedly asked for more money than the Bayern Munich manager was getting at the time.
You see, in the more recent years, Stop Muller had not only taken VFL Bochum to the UEFA Cup for the first time ever, but even Saarbrücken was only in the second tier, because he brought him there after years in the regional leagues. It's no wonder some football analysts at the time were convinced he could achieve a lot with very little, and that Leverkusen team was something. Right out the gate, they had a midfield of Michael Balak, in the words of Zidane, the only player who could replace me at Real, alongside Zé Roberto, who had literally been at Real just a few years before, and Diego Placente, who according to Top Mahler was the kind of player who never needed any training, he just did everything right, automatically. Then, at the back, Novotny was the team's commander, with none other than Lucio by his side, an absolute hidden gem who had just arrived from Brazil and had barely gotten to prove himself to Verti Vogt, and up front, Ulf Kirsten, a veteran by then but still a goal-scoring machine, Neuville, one of the most underrated German strikers of all time living the form of his life, and yet, another one of last season's signings who somehow barely got any playing time, Dimitar Berbatov. And still, when the pundits got to predict how the league table would look by the end of the season, the highest anyone thought Leverkusen could finish was 7th place. But then, then the league started. 14 matches in, Leverkusen were yet to lose and had only drawn to Bayern, Schalke and Dortmund. In the Champions League, they had easily dispatched a red star in the playoffs and once into the first group stage, they went in with three straight wins, even coming back from behind to defeat Barcelona thanks to a tactical masterclass by Top Muller, pretty much qualifying to the next round which at the time was just a second group stage but much tougher and right on that first match, they were hit with a reality check. Check. A 4 0 humiliation at the hands of Juventus, which led Lippi to claim that he never imagined it would be so easy to beat Leverkusen, completely demolishing the team's morale, which then took an even bigger hit when the news came out that Palak would leave for Bayern in the summer. Just like that, seven games later, they had added five more defeats to their record, their title charge seemed to have seriously stalled and even with Bayern succumbing alongside them, Dortmund had leapfrogged them both and gone four points on top, but then they got back to form like the flip of a switch. The very next game they hammered Mönchengladbach 5-0 in the UCL they scavenged a draw against Arsenal with a last minute goal that according to Top Muller could only be scored by Hof Kirsten and five days later they somehow put four goals past Dortmund taking back their place at the top of the table. And the next week, though they were defeated by Arsenal, that was only a mere bleep on their radar, their only defeat in a 14-match sequence, meaning that once they secured the place in the final of the German Cup, they hit a climax, getting their revenge on Juventus, defeating them 3-1 even while missing a handful of key players, leading Top Muller to start his post-match conference with a simple sentence, I never imagined it would be so easy to beat Juventus, making Lippi look quite simply stupid. And finally, as they needed the win at Deportivo to make it to the knockout stage, the weirdest thing happened. In the words of Top Muller himself, the day before the match we went for a walk on the beach and suddenly I spotted Deportivo's coach Javier Irureta going for a walk as well. I spoke with him for a while, we got along very well, and I guess I scored some sympathy points because the next day, since they were already qualified, he took out two or three good players. No Diego Tristan, no Valeron. I guess he'd rather have us in a knockout stage than Arsenal or Juventus. In the end, I found him alone in his locker room, I thanked him and he just smiled at me. But one way or another, Leverkusen were in the quarterfinals and Liverpool were salivating at the chance to put them back in their place. 90 minutes later, with the game at Hanfield done and dusted, unluckily, all Leverkusen had taken from that was a one-goal deficit. But again, someone thought it was a good idea to poke the bear. In the VIP area of the stadium, injured Marcus Babel decided to confront Top Muller, telling him that Liverpool had only conceded more than one goal once in that season, sarcastically wishing him good luck getting past him, to which he replied only, we'll wait and see. Six days later, with the second leg tied at halftime and Leverkusen needing two more goals to win the match, Top Muller went into the locker room and ironically quoted none other than Winston Churchill telling the players to never, never, never give up. And so, they did not. 
By the 64th minute, Balak pulled one back. Four minutes later, Berbatov put them in front. And even when Litmanen scored to get Liverpool ahead on away goals, Lucy showed up completely out of position and put in a true striker's finish to complete one of the greatest upsets of the season. But just as they finally earned the respect of everyone in Europe, things at home started going south. With Leverkusen 51 matches into the season and still alive in every competition, they struggled to figure out what to focus on and the score sheets were slowly tinted red. A 1-1 one -one draw at Hamburg almost felt meaningless thanks to Kaiserslautern's win at Dortmund, but a week later, a defeat to Bremen cut them deep with Dortmund securing a win thanks to a last-minute penalty and getting within two points of taking over their place at the top. Meanwhile, as they needed to put all their focus into preventing that from happening, their first leg against Man United was approaching at a violent pace, and though at Old Trafford they would play their best game of the season, somehow securing a draw and a way goal advantage, despite and luckily going behind twice thanks to a penalty and an own goal, as the crowd at Old Trafford stood up in their honor, what they failed to realize was that the only thing scarier than an European giant is a team desperate not to get relegated. Three days later, in the second to last match of the league season, Nuremberg scrapped a 1-0 win and Leverkusen went down to second. Meaning now, they would only take the league title if Dortmund themselves slipped up on the final day of the season. But again, there was no time to process anything that had just happened. Man United had arrived in town and thankfully, despite once more going behind early on, Neuville scored yet again and after surviving 45 minutes of torment at the hands of Forlan, Solskjaer and Vanisal Roy, the final whistle was heard. To confirm that over the next 14 days, Leverkusen would play three matches with each of them, allowing them to daydream about the chance to win what would be only the third trophy in their history and maybe an unprecedented German travel. And yet, just as the opportunity to break the curse came, they were hit with the most excruciating season finale in the history of football. In the final league match, Dortmund went behind early and fate was cruel enough to give Leverkusen hope one final time, allowing them to leave at the top for a little more than an hour, only to be sent back to second and deny the trophy with a mere 16 minutes left in the season. By the time the cup final was to be played, the pressure was immense. It was one thing if Bayern were in this position and ruined it. Next season they'd be back to regular schedule, but Leverkusen, they knew they wouldn't hold on to Balak, Lucio or Zé Roberto. They knew they would have to wait a lifetime for this to repeat itself, and you could see it by the way they played. Their final against Schalke was like a miniature representation of their season. They went ahead early on, seemed to be in control and then were repeatedly beaten over the head until they accepted the defeat. As one newspaper wrote, if Schalke's quick-fire double at the Leverkusen coffin measured, their fourth goal lifted Leverkusen's lifeless corpse into it and slammed the lead shot. And as much as Top Mahler would try to get the team's morale back under control, claiming that sometimes you just lose matches, as much as a shot at the biggest trophy in Europe served as some decent motivation, between them and any any sort of resurrection stood none other than Los Galáticos, the most expensive team ever assembled. And to make things worse, Zé Roberto was suspended, Novotny was injured, and that final was Real Madrid's last opportunity to not go trophyless in their 100th anniversary season. In the words of Top Mahler, in preparation for that final, I told him over and over and over again to watch out for Roberto Carlos and his throw ins. The players must have been tired of listening to the same story, and still, eight minutes in, Roberto Carlos caught him off guard, and with one touch of the ball, Real had gone in front. Thankfully, Lucio managed to level the match only four minutes later, but before the halftime break had even taken place, it happened. Zidane scored maybe the greatest Champions League final goal in history. Had the Puskas award been a thing then, surely no goal was ever more deserving. Shortly after, Lucio ended up stepping on Cesar Sanchez's foot and though no one could have predicted it, that was their death sentence. Unable to continue, the keeper had to be substituted and warming up in the sidelines was a kid, 
a kid named Iker Casillas. Save after save, it was one of the greatest goalkeeping performances of all time, and as much as Leverkusen fought, the only travel they completed was their own travel of horrors. But in reality, the true horrors were still awaiting them. Over summer, the cursed players of Leverkusen were sent off to the World Cup, and though I'm sure at some point they thought this would be an opportunity to right the wrongs of their club season, by the end, they almost wished they had come back home empty-handed, because all they got was yet another silver medal. As for Top Muller and Leverkusen, well, things were never the same. The team just seemed broken mentally, they were struggling for each and every single win, and by the end of the year, the sights were unbelievable. Top Muller was being handed the Manager of the Year award, as his own club set four points above relegation. And when two months later he got the sack, their director of football would put it best. The players are still sitting in the cinema dreaming of last season. Unfortunately, they haven't realized the film has finished. And once Leverkusen narrowly avoided relegation in the last match of the season, the club finally reached the final stage of grief, at times the most depressing, acceptance. Issuing themselves a trademark for the name Neverkusen. And for over 10 years, there was no sign of change until today. So to Chabi Alonso and his men, I say one thing. Please, don't let it happen again.